There we go. Live streaming is on. Okay, so if I, um, there's about a five second delay. Uh, about a five second delay. Shut that down. So yeah, 40 audio video, all right. Um, and then you can add me live stream to the world. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, the meetings which are on. You can join via a web page as long as it uh, supports WebRTC. Um, so Chrome tends to be all right. Uh, and there's an applications within um, on your iOS and, and Android. So the device you do need to join join via an application. Uh, and if you join by the application, you can do screen control as well. We were having uh, problems with the Android application with the meeting, so we had to keep shutting it down to connect to a new meeting. Uh, it seemed to work out fine on iOS, didn't it? But yeah. Okay. Um, certainly, certainly with the eight by eight app, it works fine on my Android. I haven't seen, I haven't played with a standalone, so I will take your word for that and have a look. Uh, I know in terms of the meeting, this this will be available as a standalone, I believe, uh, this sometime this autumn. So you can have the, the meetings as a standalone with some limitations, and then you can upgrade. Essentially, you know, our overlords want to want to take on Zoom in their arrogance. So that's the sort of aim of this. Okay. Okay. So done. Um, calls. Excuse me, meetings. Okay, we do do fax. Okay, which tends to be quite marmite, but it's desk to desk. So I can send and receive. Um, and there are a load of call forwarding, etc., which I won't go through, but you've got a load of preferences around call forwarding. So, you know, you can, you know, an inbound call, you can route on CLI. You know, date and time, that sort of stuff. So, you know, I'm going to be busy. So all calls go to my voicemail, apart from my wife, because I want to stay married, which will come through those sorts of things. Can you um, have, if you have multiple devices, logged on, say you've got your desk phone and your mobile device and uh, a, a client on your laptop, can you set which ones ring at different times and bits and pieces like that? Or is it okay that they yeah, they basically all sing. So if you've got your mobile phone and your uh, handset and desktop all logged in, you get an inbound call phone, they will all ring. Right. Okay, so you can't set that. You can you can actually flip between the two. So if I do take a call on my um, you know, mobile app, I can go to my desktop application, just dial star 88, and it will flip across. And vice versa, I can move it to other devices. And certainly, if you move it to your mobile, you can decide whether you want that to be, um, you know, over the GSM minutes or over Wi-Fi, sort of 4G, depending on where you are. So you do have that ability. But yes, they will all sing, which um, has annoyed people in the past. Um, but yeah, they'll do that. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Does a pre-call get dial tone or ring, uh, like old tone when you're doing it? If, if you're going over data, so if you're going over to Wi-Fi or 4G, it's pretty seamless. The other the other caller wouldn't know any difference. Um, if you're going over GSM minutes, there is a you know a, a small connection delay. Uh, can we go features like uh, incoming group calls? How does that present to the user? Well, I, if you want, I was going to go through the configuration manager for that because that actually shows you the setup, um, so sort of details, um, you know, essentially how, how a ring group or a queue works, if you're happy with that. So obviously, I, I can't show it to you, um, but I can show you the configuration so at least you then know how it operates, if you're happy with that. Yep. Okay. All right. Let me uh, move that over here. Couple of the features that we have in a normal standard phone system, which is lacking from our existing Nokia solution, is little basic things like parking a call when you're in a, a small office and you, you take a call and it's for Mary on the other side of the room, and you want to be able to not transfer it across to Mary, but you want to park it for so when Mary gets to the desk, you can pick it up. Those are little things of 
I'm also interested in seeing if that's possible and how it's done. Yeah, so you can um, call Park, uh, certainly on the software. You know, if I'm on a call, you'll get a sort of button here so you can call Park, uh, but it, you won't get any flashing indication to that effect. Now, there is a um, you know, for basic function and feature. This is on our, uh, this is on our um, you know, Web page, we've got three online training, but this goes through some of your you know, base features essentially. I'm hoping it's got call park on here. Um, there you go, park a call. So okay. it's got those abilities. So, some of our customers won't be using uh, virtual office, they probably just have handsets on the desk. Can they so, also do things like call park via a handset? So you can certainly hold, I'm not sure about call park, um, and I'll be careful. So we supply Polycom, Cisco, and Yealink. Now, um, the Polycoms have got the, the biggest integration. And now, arguably, handsets on 8x8 are relatively stupid. Okay. Now, the Polycoms have got the most integration in that they will have, um, so, you know, they will go whole folk. If you dial from your desktop application, you get busy lamp fields or power keys as we call them and you can pick up from those um i don't think there are hold keys but i will check on that or park hold keys but you get the sort of lights is now that, sorry go on. is that the function keys that you can set on the, on the yeah there are function keys you can set on the polycom and that can be done centrally um sorry if i look see what they give me Okay, I will check on that. There are, there are function keys that you can set, busy lamp fields, etc. Um, you know, you've got a sidecar to that effect, and you can. There is a directory search as well, so you can search users on a directory, um, and I think you can log in and log out of queues. That that is it. Now on the Yale, so, sorry, so, go so you can, you can search this directory here, so this contact directory. Okay. So you can search. If you don't bring it up, you can search it. Um, you can do speed dial key centrally manually. Now, when you go to something like the Cisco, you no longer get the keys, as I recall, and it's a two-stage dialing. So if I was to dial from my desktop application, okay, it will actually ring the Cisco handset. You have to pick the handset up, and then it dials out. Similar with the Yay Link. Okay. Right. So what you'll find, you'll hear from us. Um, I appreciate. You know, if you're in front of a prospect, I thought you are a prospect, arguably, but uh, as you're planning on being a partner, I'm a bit more candid. The phones are, you know, we consider ourselves a software house. The phones are pretty stupid. You know, they sort of deliver voice. Most of the intelligence is in the um, software. Okay. So what other mix of handsets don't do the two-stage dialing? Is it just the phone? Polycom? It's Polycom, yeah. So if you don't want the two-stage dialing, it's Polycom. So we'd, we'd probably sell... Polycom, we do do Cisco and Yealink. They say there are um, limitations to that. So, you know, people want the, the Cisco because it's Cisco, but it is a two stage dial process. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, did some of the other features that are in the, the product can be like barge monitor whisper. So, um, you know, I could barge into day green, listen to what's going on dollar code, I can then whisper, or there's a short code that says, um, you know, I can monitor, I can then whisper, so he hears it, the other person doesn't, and we can barge. So you've got a few sort of functions around that. So if I bring up the, the config page, um, can you do auto answer on handsets? Uh, on the handset, you can. On the desktop client, you cannot. Okay, um, which can can affect things like contact center when we get to that. Um, if we get to that in the next 45 minutes, uh, we would use Bria then for things like auto answer. But okay, so in terms of how you sort of administer the system, you've got a sort of login page based on what you know abilities you've been given, depends on what it can give you. But the virtual office config manager is how you do the um, UCP anyway. 
Okay. Then I'll, I'll, I won't jump around, but everything's based on a user. So a user gets ability, so you create users. Okay, as soon as you sign them a license, okay, here, and you can sort of mix and match, decide what you want. They will then get a lot of abilities here, but just so you get an idea on the uh, provisioning, so to talk about it, here you would select the device that you'd want them to have access to, okay. So this user's now got a VVX 300. So, um, I don't want to do MAC address. If I do, I put the MAC address in, it will provision automatically. If I use an activation code, when I save this, it will create an activation code for me. Okay. Right, so is it only the VVX polycoms that are supported? So um, they are detailed on our website, but certainly when you have access to this, um, this box is essentially you're saying, I'm making this device available for our system, but these are all the devices here we, we support. Okay, so that it's not every Cisco or every Polycom, simply what you see here. Okay, so some of these we won't sell anymore, they'll be legacy. Uh, some will be the newest stuff. For the IP33. The Polycom IP331 is the one I was looking for. Yeah, well, I can search IP. Two, three, one. Okay. That would be a no. Now, I mean, Polycom would be whitelisted, so potentially we could connect it. But again, if that tends to be okay if you're just doing a couple of devices, if you want to do hundreds, um, again, I mean, at that point, I thought it's a commercial thing, you know, bust our chops to give you a better price and replace the handsets, would be my suggestion. In your opinion, what's the best deck handset you supply? So we actually supply the Panasonic. So um, uh, so we're going to do a single cell. Um, so we go this one here. So if you have a large, so uh, where you need roaming. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have done. Um, Installation of a gigaset, so the N720. Um, so we've got a couple of sites in Europe actually that required that. The way we tend to do with that is so again, I used to work for gigaset, uh, hence why we sort of do that in the UK or Europe. We would put you to a, in a or a gigaset party yourself to install and you know support because it would be a third party. Okay. Or the other option is, you know, ATAs, and you have a, a deck that uses the analog, an analog connection, which I appreciate is relatively rare these days. In terms of single cell with repeaters, it would be the Panasonic that will self-provision. If you want to go roaming, it will be a third-party device of some sort. Say we have done Gigaset. Um, and the smaller base station, is it the, I think it's the N510? Yes, the N510. So, um, they have tested that, so they've had uh, test accounts. So what we certainly have working at the moment, I can't remember the, um, there you go. So the N720, they've tested the N510, we have not. I've certainly tested the N720 and their new one, which I think is the 870. Um, this one here. So the N720, I think, is up to about 100 handsets, um, which is not there now. And the N870 goes up to thousands, potentially. Um, and they're currently doing that in a place in Belgium. Belgium, I think it is. But yeah. But you got basic telephony, you know, in and out, transfer, you know, voicemail, notification. But there's no provisioning from 8x8 on that. So you would have to arrange... You know, so if you do have 20,000 users, I'm sure we'll build something. But, um, you know, arguably you'd have 20,000 20, username and passwords you'd have to put in. Okay. Okay. Do you have um, a deck base that you're going to hit or hoping to hit or? 
Um, it's more sort of old sites, isn't it? But uh, we, yeah. we have got sites with uh, decks. Yeah, we normally... They're not very big. Yeah, I mean, we've we've got a, a couple of them. Again, it, I suppose you can argue it's a sort of a hole which we fill with Gigaset. Quite often they will try Wi-Fi. Um, but again, they, you know, one, they won't survey Wi-Fi properly. And because of the areas they're in, you know, they'll, they'll buy you know, cheap Android devices or whatever, you know, and the antenna is not going to be just not going to be very good. So they tend to, it tends to, tends to fail on that sort of stuff. Obviously, deck is, is sort of built for that environment. But yeah, we don't have a multi-cell. We sort of bespoke it with something like Gigaset. But yeah, the, the, uh, the thing with that would be that we won't look after the Gigaset side. So we can certainly put you in touch of a Gigaset partner if you're not one yourself. So. OK. Um, right, ring groups. So uh, an eight by eight world, we have ring groups and queues. Okay. Um, so in terms of licensing, you can have as many as you want. We're going to configuration. So let's sort of see how it works. Okay. You have to give it a name, it has an internal number, and you can direct, you know, telephone numbers at it or multiple telephone numbers directly. Okay. In terms of display, you can decide. So what do you want? Okay. Tends to be ring group and cause name. So when you receive a call, that's what it will display in your handset and your desktop application and your mobile. And you've got these, you know, these sort of ring patterns. So it's pretty basic, your basic ring group. Okay. We can play marketing messaging, you know, rather than ring back, but bear in mind that will be determined by the carrier they ring in on. So, you know, ring back can be generated by the handset, it can be generated by the carrier, or they'll pass through um, you know, whatever's been sent. And you just add members and you can sort of drag and drop them as well. Okay. You've got a voicemail and then you've got some call forwarding rules, you know, busy. But a lot of our things are this connection is down, so it's SIP. You're always registering to us. If you no longer see a registration, then that is an internet connection down. Okay. All right. Can you call forward to another ring group and almost do like a, a step between ring groups before eventually heading at a voicemail? Yeah, so if you do your call forwarding, um, you actually see selected service, you can send to an external number, you know, you can send it wherever you want, okay, uh, to another ring group, okay, you know, to an auto attendant, uh, you can send it. And what controls and timings for that? So that will be under your, so if you turn it on a forward, you've got this, um, you know, no answer. No, yeah, what 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 timer is that? Is that a generic timer or is there only? Ah, oh, sorry, that's okay. Yeah. So, hold on, man. Yeah. If you forwarded, the call came in, it had your ring group one, and then it went through to ring group two, and then you wanted it to go to voicemail. Would it go to the voicemail of the original ring group or the the ring group before it went to voicemail? <laughs> that is a question. Um, that is a great question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, ring group, uh, voicemail. I'll find out. Um, group. Okay. Um, I've got a funny feeling you can test that, but I'll find that out for you. Um, because you're right, you'd want to know that. Now, so that's all well and good. The thing to bear in mind with our ring groups is that uh, in this example, if all three of these people are on the phone, that room, ring group is busy and the call has to go somewhere else. It will not sit and wait. Yeah. It will follow your busy. Okay. And we have people that have put this to another ring group. Okay. And if they're busy, it's gone back to the originating ring group. If that happens, the call will fail. Okay. Right. So if you then therefore want you know, calls to stack up in 8x8 world, you have to create a queue. What, what about if, um, oh, sorry, just on the ring groups, if you have one phone that's busy at the time of the call coming in, two phones are ringing, um, will that phone start ringing as soon as it uh, ends the call or will it then be out of that call, that potential call? I believe it's out. Um, so, using SIP, yeah. it will come because it will miss the invite. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it'll reject the invite. So it won't. Yeah, it won't ring until a new call comes in. And then just get reinvited every fifteen seconds, is it based on that timer? Uh, that I don't know without playing around. Yeah, that I don't know. Could uh, use uh, some kind of call pickup to pick up the ringing phones. So that's what we use on other ones, isn't it? Yeah, so we have, there is group there is group pickup. So that can be certainly be configured, which is uh, essentially a, a DTMF code. So you've got a group called pickup, so you can create pickup groups. Yes. Okay. Another question on that on ring groups: Can you be a member of multiple ring groups, or are you only allowed to be in one? You can be uh, in multiple ring groups. Okay. And the next question you may ask is: A ring group cannot be a member of another ring group. Okay, so you can't have super groups. Okay. No. <laughs> if that's where you were leading, which I assume would have been the next question, but yes. <laughs> and the call pickup um, code can be assigned to a, a function key. Yes. Yeah. I mean, essentially, it's a, a yeah. It's a, it's a DTMF a DTMF code. So, for instance, on the desktop application, um, there isn't a group pickup, you know, button here. So you would actually create it as a my contact, you know, and you know, dial from a you know a contact which would be pick up. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Cues. So. Queues, obviously similar to ring groups. Okay, so you've got to give it a name, center number, you can allocate phone numbers to it directly. Um, now, maximum calls in a queue, you can have up to 20. So that would be, you know, all your agents are busy. You can then have 20, uh, up to a maximum of 20 waiting. And the 21st will follow your busy forward route, essentially. Okay, so you can take this up and down. Okay, with a maximum of 20. Now, Back end, we can change that. So we have done that for um, you know a couple of doctor surgeries where they wanted I don't know, 30 or 40 calls waiting. We can do that from back end called interest switch. Um, the caveat to that being that if they they won't see it here on the front end, and if they were to change it here at the front end, it will mess up their setting. What about if there's not a busy um, or for you know forward on the um on the group, will it then give busy back to the caller? You're always going to have to have uh, a forward destination. Uh, so when queue is full, I'm just seeing whether you can say busy. No, you can't. It has to go somewhere. You So on every group, you've got to have a forward. Yes. So there'll be a forward destination. It's got to go somewhere. Yeah. Whether that be voicemail or to somewhere else. Correct, yeah. Can you forward it back to yourself? Uh, the call will fail because if you forward it back to yourself, the key's already busy, so it will just do a, a loop. And it won't warn you of that. The call will fail. Assuming it can do that, I'm pretty sure it won't. But, um... Okay, so if you wanted to do that, we'd have to set up two groups exactly the same to sort of. Yeah, but you'll forward into another group that's already busy again, aren't you? So yeah, so you do need to go to a, you know an auto attendant or a voicemail. I mean, again, if you're getting, I would argue, if you're getting more than twenty calls, I mean, bear in mind this is an informal, inbuilt contact center. You know, if you're now getting thirty or forty calls waiting, you probably want contact center proper, for want of a better word. Mm. Okay. More likely, you want bums on seats. Yeah. 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 And then you don't have those limitations based on the number of agents. So, okay. But we can push it up. So again, if you do have that, I would argue that's a get out of jail rather than something other than that. But yeah. So, but if you've got sites that are queuing more than 20 calls at any one time, yeah, it's whether the uplift to the contact center is worthwhile or not. Yeah, no, yeah, I get that. It's just um, also with, with the having to have a forward. So we do have some customers that want calls to ring on one group, one group only until it's answered or until they give up. Um, yeah, which actually uh, leads me on to uh, one of another one of our little idiosyncrasies. So I've taken you happy with wrap up time and alert and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
in terms of in the queue, you get a you know if they're busy, you'll get an upfront meeting, a music on hold, and a repeat message, and then you can give them voice versa relatively straightforward there. Okay, so the cab I was talking about, in terms of forwarding, you can forward all, connection down when a queue is full, or if they've all logged out, there is not a no answer forward. Okay, so once the call hits a queue, it will essentially stay in that queue until it's answered, they hang up, or they give the option for voicemail. There's no overflow on time. So again, if I'm pitching this, okay, we'll, is there a breakout? No breakout. The only breakout they got is to voicemail. Okay. All right. So if I'm pitching this, I would I would say we don't overflow on time. We overflow on availability, which is much better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But so you've got primary and secondary members. So we'll always put a call to a primary. You only go to secondary if all the primaries you know have locked out, don't answer. Or are busy. Okay. Now, I, and does I, it add you to ACD for uh, selecting the, the people in the primary, so the people that have been idle the longest? So in default, um, your your call routing is cyclic. So right. we'll cycle through. Okay. Um, and you don't have there are no settings here for you to change that. Similarly, back end we can change that to be longest idle or to be cyclic repetitive. So it'll always start with a, a particular thing. Okay. Again, caveat to that is if they make changes here, it can mess up the back end. Okay. okay. So ideally you got primary, secondary, and it's a cyclic you know, ring pattern. Okay. I gotta think, you know, if you've got a deal where they they you know they, the caveat is they have to have longest idle. We'll turn longest idle on. We're not idiots. But you know, there's caveats to that. You know, you need to know it. Our support department need to know it. So when they ring in and say our oh, ring pattern's not working correctly, they know it's been set at a what we would call interest switch level. So with with the when you say make changes, if um you were to add a new user, would that be considered a change that would affect the longest idle setting? Potent potentially, yes. Um, have I gone in and tried each one? No, I have not. But potentially, yes. Fair enough. Yeah. That's just a more so we're aware, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think because again, we will add settings. So it's, a, it's a, what really needs to happen is that you know if we've set up one of these, so we increase the queue count, or we've done the longest idle, you know, everyone in the chain needs to know. So support need to know so that you know when they're asked a question, they don't look like a doofus because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. You know, it's there front and center that, you know, if this happens, it's because such and such has been done. So really, it's just about information throw. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right, so um, in terms of anything, uh, so auto attendance, I assume you're relatively happy with that. I don't know if you've seen this or not. I'll take it by the silence up to no. Okay. Okay. So auto attendance, again, you can create as many you want. They're relatively straightforward. Now, the only way to schedule a call is through an auto attendant. So the only scheduling ability you have are with an auto attendant. So if you want calls to ring somewhere, you know, nine to five, somewhere else, you know, overnight, then you have to push the call through an auto attendant. Okay. Again, you can have as many auto attendants as you want fair use and if you don't want to put up announcements you can do that so you can skip the playing of the prompt and you can make it so that they don't have any action so any caller ringing in you know so if you want to ring you know accounts nine to five voicemail outside of that you can still do that to an auto attendant and they won't hear any announcements and as far as the call is concerned it will just ring during the day and go voicemail at night okay so the only way to schedule calls is through an auto attendant and essentially you've got open closed and lunch You've got a holiday menu for your uh, sort of other hours. Okay. This alternate menu, okay, can only be turned off and on through the admin access here. Okay. So you turn it off and on here. So we do not have a night button. Some people told that you, you could have a night button. So, okay. so if, you, if you want a night button, uh, there are two options. Okay. You give them. Uh, admin access and they can come here to the auto attendant and click it on so they have to log in etc 
Okay. Um, we can essentially gerrymander some nonsense off where you would put, push all calls to a, a phone. Essentially, you just set two call forwards, one to the auto attendant, one somewhere else. Uh, I did have a quote from our professional services team, which came in at about $5,000 if you wanted a button on a phone. That's what that's talking about, and it's all right. So we don't do an eye button. So there are, there are ways around that. You know, so put the calls to a queue where they all log out. It will go elsewhere. Um, like I said, the fraud on the handset, but yeah, ultimately it's, it's really scheduling. You know, um, again, you just need to be aware of that. I appreciate down at the you know sort of SMB smaller seat ends more of a problem than when you get up to your sort of mid market enterprise where it's not even on their radar. But I get in that you know lower seat range you know you are going to hit that so there, there isn't a way of sort of forcing an emergency mode or anything like that either from the handset or well, not really from a handset now i mean it, it, again we have done it we had a big site where they needed this this sort of thing and they um we actually what we we we, we, we had a essentially a user account which sat in front of the main number so you pointed that essentially to a phone or a user and then you would forward that user either to the auto attendant because it's got an extension number or you know, to voicemail or to a mobile. So you, you would do then do it through the handset or the desktop application. Um, but you know, you were, you were consuming a user license for that effect. And how would this log out of uh, a queue to force it to go to a night mode? Can they do it via a handset? Yeah, so um, essentially you have uh, one of your core forward settings is, you know, when all agents are logged out or have set DND, where do you want it to go to? So you can, you can send it at that point to arguably wherever you want. In terms of how they log in, log out, if they got the desktop application, you've got a, a button here where you can just log in, log out, and I think you can do it via DTMF. So I think it's 557 or 556, and then you're prompted. You know, do you want to log in? Do you want to log out? So that's how you do it from a handset um, or your your, de your mobile application. If you don't answer a call distributed to you through a queue, do you get logged out or you remain logged into that queue? You are essentially you've got this option here, which is delay after not answering. So um, you I remember do, that. Yeah. yeah. So did up to a maximum of 120 seconds, or two minutes. And then they'll be offered calls again. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't log them out. It just will no longer present them with a call for a set period. Okay. Do they get notification of that at all? Uh, only in, you know, here they get missed calls, and potentially you know the, the, the pop up when they're there, they'll see it. But yeah, that'll be it. Yeah, and I could just imagine customers coming back saying, oh, that person's taken, you know, two calls where I haven't had any, and it's because they've missed one and not realized it. Yeah, I mean, so you'll get, you'll get your missed calls detailed there. Um, and also, if you use calls, there are some sort of additional analytics. Um, I'll bring up. Have you seen the analytics in any shape or form? Uh, briefly, not very, very briefly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is so this is the UC side of the analytics. So this is where. So if you've got essentially queues, okay, and you have the right licensing type, you then get some sort of additional reports. So you get a wall board. Again, you can't customize this. What you see, what you get. You can only display one queue at any one time. Uh, the number. So the, the count will essentially update within five seconds, and these timers, I think it's over 10 minutes or 15 minutes, they will update. Okay. Again, you can set, you know, pick different queue. Um, Does that take a license to log in on that, or it can... So it'll be part of um, your user account. So if I bring this back up, so if I go to a user, they will need an X4 license for this. So to answer your question, yes, it will. But you have these um, 
for analytics and you, you decide what they have access to. So supervisor has access to it. But yes, you'll need to go to a web page. You will need to log in you know, with that account and then you'll have access to those analytics. So if you wanted five warboards, you would need five people with the X4 account. Okay. Okay. Again, again, it's you know, sort of designed informally. This is where you get our crossover, you know, you know, do the uplift to the, the contact center, which I appreciate pricing wise is, is quite a lot. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's when you hit that gray area where this is not quite enough or, you know, those sorts of things. But they can both have made on the PC and still logged in on the other PC, or is it um, you can only sign into an account once? So no, because you're, you're logging in through your single sign-on, so the web page, your desktop application, all that will, will be fine, okay? Um, you'll bring up the analytics, just means if you log into the analytics elsewhere, it will then stop on whatever window you're on. Right. Okay. Okay. right. So that's just sort of multiple wallboards here. So similarly, you know, so you've got multiple queues here. And again, these, these counters will, you know, within five seconds, either in 15 minutes. And you can actually set very base, it says. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. You can set uh, very basic um, filters in here, okay? So, um, so if you get to a certain amount, it will then basically go black, that's it. So again, it's basic. Right. And you've got queue listing, and then uh, I think if you go in, you actually get this sort of report, which will give you um, some basic timings, you know, when you had a number of calls at certain times of the day. So we actually use the full, comp this is a corporate account I'm looking at, um, which is why there's no statistics in here. Okay. But that's the sort of information you get. And then there's a, like a CDR, you know, text, uh, raw data, you know, of calls within the queue. Okay. As soon as you evoke a queue, you get sort of this extra information within the reporting. And can that CDR sort of be um, exported to an email uh, automatically, or is it something that is that more sort of reporting? So in terms of scheduling, you got two options. So we've got two types. So schedule reports, um, and in schedule reports, essentially you've got three. You've got something called company summary, which is a broad overview, extension summary, which is a summary of extensions, and then the raw data. They can be scheduled and you will get a notification saying the report is ready. You don't have to log in and download it. Okay. And then we can and then we can email reports. And the two reports we can email are the extension summary and the raw data. And that can be the CSV. Okay. Okay. We've got an API. So if you want to connect up and you know, pull down the CDR information, you can do that via an API. Right. Okay. Uh, so if you want to do that and crunch it yourself, feel free. And the only uh, caveat for the API is that it has to be essentially allocated to a user that has got analytics access. Okay. You don't need a separate license, but it needs to be a user with analytics access. Okay. Um, were you shown the, certainly as a partner, were you shown the cool quality report? Yes. Okay. Um, now, again, what we've previously done with this is, so this is not productized for, so we certainly have a portal where we can, you know, so our support department uses this where we can go in and look at any system. Okay. We haven't productized this so that you could go to any of your customers and look at it yourself. So um, what previous partners have done, have said to 8x8 that for every site we install, you need to give us an X4 license because that gives us this quality reporting so we can diagnose calls. Okay. So you then essentially have a, a user account for every one of your sites right. that will give you this. So um, I take it you, you you saw that you can look at an individual call and all the geek information you get, yes? Yeah, we yeah. saw that. Okay, all right. I won't, I, won't, I won't bore you with it again as long as you're happy with that. But yeah, so certainly from your point of view, what previous partners have done, is that you know if you're doing certainly if you're doing first line support, you know, this sort of information is handy. 
just on um, sort of almost taking a step back, logging in to uh, do programming on the customer's site, would we need a user on each account to be able to do that, or do we have an overall logging where we can see all of our systems? I believe you will, if you don't have it, you will have it so that you'll have an overall system where you can log into your, um, your, your systems. In terms of having access to an account, um, it doesn't, certainly admin access doesn't require a license. Right. Okay, so you just, you can create, you can create a user, not allocate a license, but that user under um, this company admin can be allocated admin access. All right. Again, caveat on this, at, at the moment, if you have admin access, um, there's no role-based account, you know, account limitation at the moment. Okay, that is coming. You would have to do that on each side that you're all programming. Yeah, so if you yeah, if you've got admin, you've got full admin access. Uh, but yes, all you need all you need to give someone admin access, they, you need a first name, last name, and an email address. Okay. okay. That essentially Just creates so, a user. Last name, does that have to be unique? Sorry, say again. The, for the name, does it have to be unique? No. So what needs to be unique is your user. So you'll have a username. This is what you use to log in. So this username here is a bit that needs to be unique. Right. Okay. Now, um, that needs to be um, not only unique on your system, but globally unique on 8x8. So if you're using an email address, that's fine. Um, yeah, but you can't have... You know, so I'm Matthew Marchant. So if I put Matthew Marchant in here, that means no one else can use Matthew Marchant within 8x8. So you best stick into an email address or something like that to use it. Yeah, I mean, certainly if you, if you get us to suggest it, it comes up with some, you know, not quite random, but it'll be the tenant name followed by something else in your full name. But yeah, you can sort of create what you want. And certainly there is a bulk upload. So, you know, um, you can download a template you know, you know create all the things that you can your sort of bulk up up the bulk upload you know multiple users rather than one by one and if you get any syntax errors there's an option here tasks so you would go here you know so you've done on a lowercase s for the license or something you know it it should detail those information there so you're not sort of fighting around too much okay there is bulk up that bulk upload and download. So if we needed to make a change across all the extensions on the live site, could we take a download, make that change uh, on the download, and then re-upload and apply it? Or is that only for creating them to begin with? Uh, I'm going to ask that, because I don't know. Um, I'll play two minutes. I will ask. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. In my defense, I am in a honeymoon period where I point at all the shiny things and say, isn't it wonderful? Not the nitty gritty. So I tend to throw that over our deployment department and they'll do that. But I'll find out to you. Okay. okay. I appreciate we've got um, 13 minutes. <laughs> um, I, know we haven't, I know we haven't touched on contact center. Um, Can I just I ask then probably about five quick questions? Just so yep. to get covered. Um, so can you see um, the programming in reverse, such as looking up a DDI and see what is using that um, DDI? Um, so there isn't, there isn't a download of, of, of all the programming. So no, you can, um, for instance, download information about the user. So if you want to know a DDI that one, there'll be some numbers there. All phone numbers are still listed here uh, in the list, so you can see where they're assigned here. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you don't have a full programming uh, uh, you know, download of the whole system. No, you, you can sort of jump in and out and get certain bits. Okay. Um, can you look up? Yeah. Yes, it does. Can you look up uh, MAC addresses? Um, that is you 
you can see, I don't know. And, oh, look, there you, you can't look at them all, but you can certainly look at devices and find the MAC addresses here. And there is a generate okay. devices report. So um, okay. that will give you some information. So yes, in a format. Yes. So it looks like you can filter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The reason for that, Matthew, just so you're aware, is when we're going to a leasing company, we need to supply serial numbers of all devices that the, the, the leasing uh, agreement is covering. And it's easier for us to pull it off the website than it is to scan each device in on site. Yes, I can believe that, yeah. I mean, certainly we have other, but if you, we have other back end tools that certainly um, I'm aware of, which would list all devices that are registered. Maybe not the ones they've got, but certainly ones that are registered. But yeah. Okay. So is there a, a tool that we'll have access to, to that will allow us to see whether handsets are registered or not? Uh, only what you've seen here. So um, So we won't know if it's being plugged in in use. We've got the active there, so it's very active. You, you do have this sort of device report here within the analytics X4, give you sort of device status. This will tell you ones that are logged in currently. Uh, I'm not sure if it gives you MAC address or whether it's just IP. Yeah, so it's just IP. Can you yeah, go back to the device because I'm sure it said on there whether it was active or not. Uh, before this page, Matthew. All oh, right, sorry. So we were looking at the devices, uh, not in the reports, but actually on the portal. Oh, you mean um, the admin portal? Admin. Uh, yeah, because we've got assigned to use active. So if you do view where the reports, say for the Polycom v VVX 500, so we've got the two devices. Yeah, so that's the. So that device report that I um, downloaded actually gives you all this. You can see I haven't done this before. But yeah, so you've got device model, your activation code, and you've got status. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you've got Mac. Oh, yeah. And you've got the Mac. Oh, yeah. Right? Okay, that's Mac good. address on the left as well. Yeah. Mac, yeah, Mac address. Yeah, the, Mac, the Mac password is when we provisioned, we changed the default password. So that's if you want to log into it locally. So there you go. I should, I'll, I'll pretend like I knew that beforehand. Yes, you can do all that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making the assumption that activated it's the initial, not the that one. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, that does say active rather than activate. So if you, if you click on the view device report, one of those. That just shows you for the uh, individual one. Oh. So I, I clicked on that generate devices report, which gave me this yeah. spreadsheet. So that gave you the Mac, the password, device model, extension, et cetera. So, yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, Ready. Next okay. question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, can you have various hold musics on a single account? So for so, different, different work groups. So you can only have uh, one live at any one time. So as a user, this is per user. You can set your mute on hold. And obviously on a queue. So it's per, user. So it's per user, yeah. So that would be then play. Then you can set obviously queue in a queue. Uh, you've got music on hold, so you can set that. Um, but yeah, where are we? Music on hold. So you know you can essentially upload a file. Or you know, ring okay. get, it, get it to ring so you. So the user that puts it on hold is the music on hold. They get played. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if uh, yeah, so, and it'll, be, it'll be whatever yeah. they say as a user. Yeah. Okay, that's great. And I'm assuming you can set that in bulk, so you don't need to do it per user. Uh, we can. You can't. Right. Okay. Um. All right. Um, some customers don't like dialing nine as a prefix. Is that mandatory? Uh, you don't dial. Yeah, indeed, indeed, you know, you can dial nine if you want. That's in there. But you don't dial nine. You just dial the telephone number. So it is um, from the handset as well. From a handset as well. So it's M block dialing. Okay. 
So it's not overlap, it's block. So you have to dial a number and press dial. Okay. And my other last three questions relate to uh, contact sensor. Okay. Um, is there a is there a Windows client instead of using a the web browser? No. So the uh, for the contact center, it's it's web. So you need to have all. It's not a Windows client. It is a uh, it is purely a web client. So don't. Okay. So so if a web, um, if the application wasn't front and center, I mean the the browser, how would they get notified visually of calls coming in? And, and so you, you can't have a little, you can't have a little pop up. Um, so you can configure the pop up, um, but it is web based. So this is where, yeah, you can run into, into issues so where, <laughs> yeah. So, so so the handset or wherever you direct the voice uh, within the contact center. It's literally that voice. So even the inbound number you'll see ringing on your device will be incorrect. All the information is through the GUI. So you do get, uh, you know, where suddenly they have to have two screens or they're, you know, having to move it around, uh, you know, resizing it so that they've got the agent GUI always, mm -hmm. always available. So it, it is the main the interface. Browser down the browser is closed down as signed to Sorry, didn't catch that again. If the browser is closed down as signed to it will time out, yes. I think initially the first call, if you just shut it down, not log out, I think you will get one call. So the users will still use the virtual office as a soft phone? Can be, yes. I mean, it can, it can work as an overlay. So uh, certainly the contact center, they, they use as a profile. So it was originally an overlay. So you decide, you say, where do I want my call to go to? And that can be anywhere, as long as they got a direct number. If you're using our back office, so the the eight by eight, what you then get is that there is sort of integration between the two services. So you get presence, instant messaging, and a sort of shared number plan. It just means that from a directory page, I can see the whole estate as an agent. So I can see not only my fellow agents, but you know also the back office staff, whether they're available, and I can sort of instant message or call them. Okay, and um, it was. Excuse me. One last question for me. Um, I think this was kind of covered already when we were there, but um, this relates to um, us in-house uh, more. Some of our teams, when they dial out, depending on the area code that they're dialing, it presents the number as coming from a different area code. Yeah, we, we have a we have a list of a um, an S. A number on each STV code in the country. So when uh, someone dials out to a person, we present their local number because they're more likely to answer it than if it's from a, uh, a non-geographic or something. I mean, it would, I'm assuming we need some kind of professional services or something to, to do that. Yeah, so certainly, um, depending on where you're dialing from the contact center, it can be you can select it similarly with the uh, the UC piece. If I bring it up, you know what so happens at the moment is that it actually looks up from a database. So, for instance, if we're dialing uh, someone that has an 01403 number, it looks at the database. It's 01403. Okay, I'm going to present this 01403 one two three four five six number out. Yeah. So that wouldn't be native. That would be. Um, professional services to do that. So at the moment, so if, you, if you just bought it off the shelf, yes, we can supply numbers in those areas and it will be a manual selection. So I, I want to ring 0177, I'd have to go in manually and decide, right, I'm going to use an 0177 number. Right. Another quick question, hopefully. Um, does every user need to have a phone number assigned to them? Yes, everyone has to have a DDI. That's where the system works. So they all have a direct number. Um, now, whether you display that for outbound calls is um, entirely up to you. So when you just when you make an outbound uh, for external access, you could use their main number or you know withhold it. But they do have to have a DDI. And they bundled in with the license. From the yeah. 
So uh, in default with a tenant, you'll get tenant for each sort of X license you buy that comes with a, a phone number. Okay, and I think you get two phone numbers of the tenant. Any additional phone numbers, you know, we charge a license for, or there's a license for. I take it you have quality agreements with uh, lots of different people, BT, Gamma, all the, the main ones do for getting numbers in? Yeah, UK. In fact, we house our numbers either in Gamma or Colt. So when we port them in, when they come to us. So, um, but yes, we got the usual ones in UK and we can, you know, do a hundred odd countries worldwide as well, expanding. Now there are some limitations, you know, so you might have to have an address there or we can only do national numbers or only international toll free. We can't do emergency dial, but yeah. So if you've got a particular country, let us know and we can tell you what we can and cannot do. And can you trigger the ports or do they just happen as a win? So we, we sort of organize them um, that we're going to our porting, but certainly with the system, when it's provisioned, you'll have temporary numbers um, set up, okay, with the number that the port's going to be. So you can sort of pre-test the system and we can spoof as well. So you want to go live beforehand. You know, we can spoof the number, so when they're dialing out, it looks like they're dialing from the number, even though it hasn't been ported. Okay, and can we do this spoofing, or do we need to request that from you to add numbers? That's, that's uh, you have to come to us again. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. Have you had problems with Gamma and calling mobiles and international numbers? Because we've had problems with the asserted identity with them before. So um, in terms of sort of outbound, sorry, bear with me one moment. Um, I'll tell the guy on my next call, that'll be five minutes. So in terms of uh, the, the way it works, sort of outbound calls is, um, you know, it, each of our data centers we got um, carries into, you know, BT, Gamma, um, Verizon and a few others. So depending on the data center, it depends on our PSTN connections, and we also got internet connections. So when we're routing calls, you know, the cost obviously uh, comes into account, but it's also based on quality. So you know, if we're going over gamma and the quality is dropping, we could then shift over to BT for international calls or whatever it may be. Some of that is automated, some of that is manual. Okay, so you know, if for whatever reason you can't get to mobile numbers through gamma. Okay, and we could ship it to BT. I appreciate if they're a gamma mobile number, they're doomed anyway, but we will, you know, reroute calls based on quality. Again, some of that is automatic, some of it is manual. Okay. Yeah. Except from us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we might have a look at call center a bit more in depth at some point, but definitely from the, the basic telephone, I'm quite happy. Yep, yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you, Matthew. I'm conscious you've got a conference call as well now, so thank you very much. Yeah, no, um, so again, if you have a word with Dave Green, we can always set up a, a follow on for the. I appreciate we spent 30 seconds on the contact center, and I know that's a bigger beast. Um, but yeah, we can do another session. Um, we might even get in a room together if we finally get that. But yeah, if you have a word with Dave, you can organize that. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to do that so we've got hands here so we can start playing and uh, trying to break the system. Everyone always wants to break it, but yes, no, I, I get that. I would be the same if I was in your chair. So, to be fair, when I first joined, that's the first thing I did was try and break it. So. Okay. FA, you know what's going on, so that's excellent. Thanks for your time. All right, thanks, gents. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Bye, bye.